Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today I will solve some problem that you will find on page number 1117. Please turn to it. Page number 1117, number 11. Number 9 and 10 that you see on that page are the two that we did yesterday on day number 61. And today I will pick up from, from number 11. As you can see, question number 11 is, is already on the blackboard. We are given this picture. We are told that x plus y equals u plus w. And our job is to figure out which, which one of these three statements must be true. Let's get going, shall we? We know that x plus y, we are told here, that x plus y is equal to u plus w. But let's start with x plus y, x plus y plus z. Which we can see is sitting on a straight line, which means x plus y plus z must be 80 degrees. Similarly, t plus u plus w, t plus u plus w, also adds up to 80 degrees, which means these two coordinates are equal. We know that x plus y, has to equal u plus w, which means they cancel out and we can immediately see that t must equal z. And that's right here. Statement number three works. Statement number three works. Let's do, let's do the next one. Let's begin now that x plus y is equal to u plus w. But if you look at if you look at y and u, y and u they are vertical angles. We don't need to know. We don't need to know the measurements of these angles. It doesn't matter. Vertical angles are always equal. So y equals u. If y equals u, they cancel out, which means x must equal w. But it's not there. That is the dead end. So let's see what we can do with it. Let's not stop there. Well, there you go. We can carry on. So we have established so far that x equals w, but w in turn, but w in turn. Let's put it a different symbol. W in turn must equal z because W and Z are vertical angles. So X equals W and W must equal Z, which means, of course, that X equals Z. Oh, there you go. That's the statement number, statement number one. Let's, let's carry on. Let's do one more. It was getting too crowded, so I'm going to erase this so we can start again. Now we're going to incorporate everything that we know so far. X plus Y plus Z, uh, X, Y, Z, and T U W T U W. Let's incorporate what we have proven so far and see what we can do about the second one. We know x equals z. X equals z. There you go. X equals z, but z must equal w. And we also have established z equals t. Oh, there you go. Z equals t. If z equals t, if z equals t, then z must also equal, then t must also equal x because z equals x. There you go. So we established that this angle is x, this is x, this is x, and this is x. What about y and u? y and u is not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is y and w. Can we prove that y equals w? To which the answer is, to which the answer is, can y equals w? To which the answer is, y can only equal w, listen carefully, y can only equal w if y also happens to equal x w equals x. But then again, if y equals x, then u would have to equal x. So the answer, so the, so the question is, is statement number two, is, is, is statement number two true? Is statement number two true? If you were to say that statement number not true, that is not correct. Statement number two is something that is not necessarily true. It is not false. Statement number two, we cannot say that statement number two is false. What we can say is that statement number two is something that is not necessarily true. It is not something that has to be true. We're looking for something that must be true. The only way statement number two would be true, we just showed here, the only way statement number two would be true if it's all six angles are equal to each other. But if all six angles were equal to each other, the whole thing would be silly. The problem wouldn't exist. 
to be silly to ask which of the following statements must be true if we were told that all six statements are equal, all six, all six equal, equal, angles are equal. So, the, so what boils down to is the fact that the only two statements out of the three that must be true are one and three. Statement one and three, and that combination is one and three is answer choice B. Let's go to the next one, number 12. There were three statements there, there were three statements there, only two of those three were something that must be true, the third may be true, only if they're all equal to each other. If, if, we, if we encounter that part. Let's look at number 12. We are told that we have a parabola here which is a times x minus 2 and x plus 2. We are told that is vertex it sits at a point with the coordinate C D. The question simply is how much is D? How much is D? Let's find out, shall we? Before we before we look into this parabola, let's look at something simple. Let's look at something y is equal to x minus 2 times it's not x minus 2 times x plus 2, it's x plus 4. Let's look at this one first, okay? As you can see, y in this parabola, y would be zero. Y would be zero if x is equal to two. If x is equal to two, y would equal to zero. Similarly, in this parabola, if x happens to be equal to negative four, if x happens to be, rather if, if x happens to be equal to uh, yeah negative four, if x happens to be negative four, the negative four and positive four would be zero also, which tells us that the parabolas intercepts are positive 2, 1, 2, and a negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. It cuts the x-axis at this point. Let's see what we can say about the, about, the, about the vertex. But before we get to that part, we have to understand that from negative 4 to a positive 2, from a negative 4 to a positive 2, that's where it cuts the x-axis, it's a distance of 6. It's a distance of 6, which means halfway down will be right here. This is halfway down, which is x equals to negative 1. That is the line of symmetry. This guy right here is what is known as the line of symmetry. And the parabola sits something like this. Our job is to find out this point right here, the vertex. We, we already know we already know the x coordinate of this vertex. x coordinate of this vertex is negative 1 x coordinate is negative 1. How can we find out the y coordinate of this vertex? Well, if we know the x coordinate, we can put it in this equation, the equation of the parabola, and find out the y coordinate. Very simple. If x is equal to negative 1, we'll have negative 1 minus a 2, a negative 1 and a positive 4, we get a negative 3 and a positive 3, that gives us negative 9. y equals negative 9. So now the question is, what happens? So now the question is, what happens if the parabola that we're dealing with does not have this equation, but it has an equation where we have an A in front of it? Putting the A in front of it, all it does is that it just introduces A in front of everything. There you go. It just the the y the value of the y is not what it was before. It is nine times as much. Whatever the values are before for the y y coordinate, they are nine times as much because we're multiplying the entire thing. Uh, by, uh, sorry, a times as much. It's a times as much, whatever the value of a happens to be. So the so the vertex, so the y coordinates of the vertex was before nine. It's now it's not nine, but it is nine times. And there you go. We're done. It is nine times a, and we are told that the y coordinates of the vertex is d. Therefore, d must equal minus nine a. There you go. And that is answer choice a. Let's look, let's look at the next one, number 13. Number 13. In number 13, we are given an equation that looks 
something like this 24x squared we are told plus 25x minus 47 over ax minus 2 has to equal we are told minus 8x minus 3 minus 53 over ax minus 2. The first thing we notice is the denominator here that appears through the entire left hand side is the same denominator that appears in this term. If we can somehow have the denom same denominator for the entire thing, we, we can have the common denominator. Let's do this, shall we? I'm going to erase all of this thing, we don't need any more. So to find the common denominator here, we simply make it ax minus 2 as the common denominator. And this guy would be negative 8x minus 3 times this, this quantity, negative ax minus 2, minus 53. There you go. Now this side has a denominator of ax minus 2, so does the right hand side, since they have the same denominator, we can ignore it. We can, we can just multiply the entire equation by ax minus 2, it will drop out. So this quantity must equal this quantity. Let's, let's continue working on this thing. So since it's dropped out, I'm going to erase this part. It's gone. And I cannot leave it like this because it does not equal this anymore. So let's just erase this part. So this quantity equals this quantity. Let's continue. Multiply it out. We get negative 8. We just have to pay attention. 8a. 8a times x squared. As long as you pay attention, you'll be fine. Negative 1, negative is positive. So it's 16x. And here we have a negative 3, so it's going to be negative 3 ax and negative 3 and negative 2 is going to give us positive 6 and then finally we have negative 53. The very first thing we notice is that positive 6 and a negative 53, positive 6 and negative 53 is going to give us negative 47 which is exactly what we have on this side, which means that drops out. The question was, I never told you what the question was actually. What was the question? The question is, what's the value of A? Well, we have two options at this point. We can either compare the coefficient of x squared right here. The coefficient of x squared here on this side is 24 and the coefficient of x squared is negative 8, which means 24 must equal negative 8A. And we can figure out the A from there. Or, or we can compare the coefficient of x. On this side we have 25, coefficient of x on this side is 25, and coefficient of x on this side, we haven't finished it here, let's, let's take out the x common, so we have 16 minus 3a, there you go. The coefficient of x on this side is 16 minus 3a, which means 25, that we see here on this side, for, for the coefficient of x must equal 16 minus 3a. And as long as, and as long as our work is correct, as long as we haven't made any silly mistake, both of these equations should, should give us the same value of A, obviously. If we get a different value, then obviously something has gone wrong. Let's finish it up. Divide both sides by 8, negative 8, and we can we're going to find that A equals negative 3. Let's hope that we get negative 3 out of this one also. Bring the 16 to this side, so 25 minus 16 will be 9. 9 equals negative 3A. Divide both sides by negative 3, and you'll find that A equals negative 3, just like it was supposed to. They have to match, obviously. That was number 13. Let's go to number 14, shall we? Number 14. In number 14, we are given a simple quadratic equation, 3x squared, plus 12x plus 6 is equal to 0 we are told and the question simply is what's the value of x and the only thing and the only thing they're trying to see in this problem is is whether or not is whether or not we know the quadratic formula if you know the quadratic formula we all set and quadratic formula goes something like this we already know it quadratic formula is equal it tells us that x would have to equal negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. 
You must know the quadratic formula by heart before you sit for the exam. It's a must. So let's finish it up. Now we could actually continue uh, you, applying this formula in this format, but if we do that, we'll end up with very large numbers. This is a multiple of 3, 12 is a multiple of 3, 6 is a multiple of 3, 3 is a common factor. Why don't we divide the whole bloody thing by 3? If we divide the whole bloody thing by 3, you're going to find that x squared is equal to 12 divided by 3 is 4x. There you go. That's much easier, much smaller number. We can now use this now. x squared has a coefficient of 1, so therefore x, is, x would have to equal negative b, which is negative 4, plus or minus b squared, which is 4 squared, minus 4a, which is 1, times c, which is 2, over 2a, simply 2 times 1. Voila. Let's finish it up. Negative 4 plus or minus. 4 squared is 16. 4 times 2 is 8. 16 minus 8 is 8. So here we end up with square root of 8. But let's not put square root of 8 is just like that. Square root of 8 is simply 4 times 2. And square root of 4 is 2. Therefore square root of 8 is simply 2 times root 2. Let's put it like that. Let's put it like that because we have 2 at the bottom. We can divide the top and bottom by 2. So the square root of 8 is simply 2 times root 2. And we divide the whole thing by 2. And we are almost done. Negative 4 divided by 2. Negative 4 divided by 2 is going to give us negative 2, plus or minus 2 root 2 divided by 2 will simply be root 2. Voila. Where is your answer? The answer is x, x must equal negative 2 plus or minus root of 2. And that is answer choice A. Very, very first answer choice. Let's do number 15. In number 15, we are given a formula that helps us convert temperature when it's expressed in centigrade to Fahrenheit and vice versa. And the formula looks something like this. Before we do anything, anything at all, let's, let's just understand this equation in terms of slope and intercept. If we open the parentheses, we're going to end up with 5 9 f minus 5 9 times 32. This part that you see there is our intercept. Is our intercept. When f is equal to 0, that's the value of c. We're not interested in that part. We're just interested in slope. And the question that they're asking here has to do with slope. That's just the intercept. Since we are not interested in it, it's just it's just some intercept, we just put down 5 9th f plus some constant, whatever that constant happens to be. That is the c. Now what does this tell us? What this tells us is that if you increase the Fahrenheit, if you increase the temperature by one degree Fahrenheit, if the temperature goes up by if if temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit. One degree Fahrenheit, that is same as if if this goes up by one degree, the C is going to go by five ninth because that's just a constant. Changing the temperature is not going to affect the constant, which is which is probably why it's called constant. So if temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit, the temperature in expressed in centigrade will go up by. If temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit, that implies an increase in temperature of five ninth degree. Centigrade. Other way, other way, if we can interpret this thing, is if we were to change the role of independent and dependent variable. So if we continue with this one, let's put k over here. I'm just going to put down in this format 5 ninth f, 5 ninth f plus k. And if we work on that equation. Let's multiply the entire equation by 9, so we're going to get 9c over 5f plus k, 9c, and now divide by 5, so we're going to get 9 fifth, 9 fifth c is equal to f plus 
9k5, which I'm just going to call, this is some other constant. This is, the, this is some other constant, some new constant. Again, constant is not what we're worried about. What this tells us is that if Fahrenheit temper, if, if the temperature goes up by 1 degree Fahrenheit, temperature goes up by 1 degree Fahrenheit, or rather, when the temperature goes up by 1 degree centigrade, 1 degree centigrade, it increases the Fahrenheit by 9 fifth. If temperature goes up by 1 degree centigrade, that implies an increase in temperature of 9 fifth degree Fahrenheit, which of course has to be the which of course has to be the case if you just think about it, is the reciprocal of the slope. If the slope in this format is 5 9, when we write it, when we switch the role of independent and dependent variable, the slope becomes a reciprocal. If the slope here is 5 9, this has to be 9 fifth. So an increase in temperature of 1 degree Fahrenheit increases the temperature by 5 9 degree centigrade, then it stands to reason that the 1 degree increase in centigrade must increase the temperature in Fahrenheit by 9 fifth. And those are the only two statements that are given to us are true, which is statement number one and two. What, what statement number three says, statement number three says, a temperature rise of 5, 9 degree in Fahrenheit is equal to, no, that, that do not change the slope. In statement number two, the slope does not change. Slope should have been the reciprocal of it, 9 fifth, which is, oh, I never actually finished this thing. So 9 fifth, let's finish this thing. They're trying to confuse us, 9 fifth here. Let's work on this 9 fifth, I'm going to show you that 9 fifth is exactly 1.8. What the second statement says is that, what the second statement says is that, a one degree increase, if the temperature goes up by, if the temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit, the temperature rises by 5 ninth. If the temperature goes up by one degree centigrade, it goes by 9 fifth Fahrenheit. 9 fifth Fahrenheit. 9 fifth, if you multiply top and bottom by two, it just becomes 18 over 10, which is just 1.8 degree. So this thing is just 1.8 degree. 1.8 degree Fahrenheit. So statement one, statement one is true, statement two is true, and statement three is nonsensical. It makes no sense because the slope is not changed. Slope is kept the constant, is same. So the answer is only statement one and two are true, and that is answer choice D. That was the end of it. We'll meet again tomorrow and we'll pick up we'll pick up with the gradient problem that we have there, the five gradient problems that you see there, starting with the next page. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, you can send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. I can help you with the math portion of the exam, I can help you with the grammar portion, which has to do with the writing part, and I can most certainly help you with the vocabulary part for the exam. Alright? Just send me an email and we'll see what we can do. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.